Jonathan Lee Walton is a quite distinguished scholar of social ethics who writes frequently on evangelical Christianity and its relation to mass media and political culture. Jonathan is currently the dean of the Divinity School and of the Wake Chapel at Wake Forest University in North Carolina, where he also holds the presidential chair in religion and society. Before journeying south to Wake Forest, Jonathan was the plumber, you were a plumber professor, weren't you? He was the plumber professor of Christian morals and preacher, and preacher to the university at Harvard where I think he had arguably one of the toughest preaching jobs in the United States, um, preaching to Harvard's faculty and students. One of his revered predecessors, Peter Gomes, used to say that being the minister at uh, Memorial Church was like overseeing feeding at a crocodile farm. Um, I heard Jonathan often, and he did a quite job of overseeing the feeding at the crocodile farm, so congratulations. Um, his first book was entitled Watch This, The Ethics and Aesthetics of Black Televangelism, which examined the theological and political traditions of African-American religious broadcasters. His most recent book called A Lens of Love, Reading the Bible in Its World for Our World, blends his experience from the pulpit with his experience in the classroom. It gives me great pleasure, and it gives the Blasey Center great pleasure to introduce to you Jonathan, Dr. Jonathan Walton as the speaker for this year's 19th annual Blasey Center Prophetic Voices Lecture, and he's going to give us a lecture entitled, Blessed Are the Rich, the American Gospel of Success. Thank you, Jonathan. Good afternoon. It is uh, indeed a pleasure to be here today. Thank you uh, so much for the invitation and for the opportunity and for the patience. Uh, I was supposed to be here in March of 2020, I believe it was, the, literally the week the world shut down. It was scheduled. We were going back and forth, should I get on the plane, should I not, are we going to hold this, are we not, just like we were in so many other areas of our lives. Uh, but, uh, and I, when given the opportunity uh, to even consider or the consideration of possibly doing this virtually or via Zoom, I said I would actually rather come and be face to face whenever that opportunity presents itself. And I am so glad that I have been given this time, particularly as I look across this room. I am so appreciative to you, Brother Mark, for your leadership of the center. My dear brother Eric Owens and Dr. Mara Willard, so many longtime friends here. Susanna Heschel, uh, so great to see you. I'm actually teaching a course right now entitled The Prophetic Pulpit, Preacher's Public Intellectual. And my class is reading both you and your father in the course. Uh, and so um, I make, have to make sure we get a picture so that they'll know I'm legit. <laughs> uh, and to, I see what always excites me, students here in with us today. Um, I'm taking, I'm assuming this is a class of is this a class, or are you students who have just showed up with your own intellectual curiosity? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't pay them. Wow. All right. That is a testament to you. Uh, welcome. Thank you for allowing me in this space today. Uh, the title of this talk is... Blessed are the rich, uh, the American gospel of success. So this was the question when the Q&A began. What does all this obsession with money, new buildings, cars, have to do with faith in God? 
This was the question of a well-dressed man who was attending the Dahl Lecture on Religion and Money in Princeton University a few years ago. The title of my lecture on that April day was The Cultural Appeal of the Health and Wealth Gospel. And I had just spent the previous 45 minutes in Princeton giving a history of what's known as the Word of Faith movement. Anybody here ever heard of the Word of Faith movement before? The Word of Faith movement is a charismatic offshoot of Pentecostalism that's most often associated with prosperity gospel beliefs and practices. Think of well coiffed televangelists like Joel Osteen. Has anybody ever hear of Joel Osteen? So you've heard of the Word of Faith movement. Joel Osteen, his father, John Osteen, was one of the uh, central founders of that movement. And, and Jesse DePlantis and Creflo Dollar. Has everybody heard that name before? You're familiar with the Word of Faith movement, if you have. Creflo Dollar, and that is his real name. <laughs> Uh, uh, prominent televangelism, televangelist out of the Atlanta. And so I had been talking about these preachers and this particular charismatic offshoot, uh, also known as neo-Pentecostalism. And these preachers that are often known for their immaculate, sizable worship centers their luxury automobiles, their private airplanes. What does any of this have to do with faith in God? This well-dressed, polished man stood up and asked in the center of the room. The man who asked the sincere question found such spiritual expressions as foreign as the thought of Jay-Z leading the Boston Pops Orchestra. <laughs> what does these worship centers and private jets and fancy clothes, what does that have to do with God? I knew that this man was struggling with this concept because I knew who he was, actually. I knew this distinguished gentleman who posed the question. Because Brother Eric, he was a regular attendee of the Memorial Church at Harvard University, where I then was serving as the Plumber Professor of Christian Morals. And he had just happened to be in Princeton, New Jersey that day, and he elected to come learn more about my personal research interests. And like many people at the Memorial Church, he was a part of a precious crew of congregants who were much more familiar with antiques, operas, and organs than their minister's appreciation for basketball hoops, hip hop, and sermonic hooping. And definitely, they were not familiar or aware with much of my academic research, which traces and tracks evangelical movements and trends Mega churches, televangelism along the southern crest of the United States. What does this have to do with God? What does all this shiny stuff have to do with God? And it was my intimate knowledge of the questioner that led to my reflexive response, Mark. And my response was, what does a $6 million, 22 carat organ have to do with God? Here I was referring to the Memorial Church's world-class organ that Harvard had just installed a few years before. And immediately I regretted my response for its combative tone, if not for the cultural irony it exposed. You see, in my first book and in subsequent articles, I spent the first part of my career engaging and critiquing this American religious phenomenon popularly known as the prosperity gospel. 
The term prosperity gospel is typically deployed as a broad appellation to describe a variety of Protestant traditions developed in the late 19th and 20th centuries. Traditions that emphasize mind science, positive thinking, physical healing, and material rewards. These traditions include various strands of new thought metaphysics, evangelicalism, neo-Pentecostalism, and this word of faith movement that developed in the post-war context. For instance, Phineas Quimby and Mary Baker Eddy. Anybody ever heard those names before? Now we're in the tradition. The ways that they emphasize bodily healing and the power of the mind in the final third of the 19th century would fall under a broad definition of the prosperity gospel. Just as Mother Leafy Anderson's creative blend of hoodoo, Catholic, and Native American informed spiritualism in New Orleans at the outset of the 20th century was also concerned with material benefits such as warding off evil spirits, increased employment opportunities, and even striking revenge on a former enemy, former employer, or former lover. That's one of the reasons that anytime people talk about the prosperity gospel in America, it has to be plural. It's better to say prosperity gospel theologies or prosperity theologies in order to capture the multi-traditioned histories and conceive of competing theological frameworks. Moreover, the term prosperity must be contextualized and contrasted against its own use by different people and different movements. Quote unquote, prosperity is not a meta-theological category signifying the same meaning across space, time, and religious tradition. For some, prosperity has connoted community uplift and collective concern. Think the African American church, African Methodist Episcopal church, the African Methodist Episcopal church. We lift as we climb, seeking for ourselves. Founded in Philadelphia, late 18th century. Resistant movement to apartheid in Philadelphia in congregation, in the Episcopal congregation. Where people who were members of the Free African Society decided that they were animated by their faith to actually do and to create their own and establish their own. Why? Because God did not view them as second class citizens. But then there's others that view prosperity as it relates to individual ac accomplishments and accumulations of material goods on a personal level. Well-being. Anybody here ever heard of Norman Vincent Peale? We're in the tradition, right? As one thinketh, so is she, so is he. The power of positive confession, because the power of life and death is within the tongue, the scripture will say. And so therefore, as one speaketh into the air, one sets the atmosphere for one's condition of living. Norman Vincent Peale. But at the heart of all of these theologies is a particular conception of Jesus. Mary Baker Eddy's Jesus was the absolute harmony of life and love, God and man. This Jesus provided the ultimate example of overcoming sin and illness. Current word of faith preachers like Kenneth Copeland or Creflo Dollar, they follow a gentleman, a mind science teacher from New England, Essex William Kenyon. And this tradition views Jesus as a sacrificial lamb who came to lift those who believe in him to a quote unquote higher life in Christ. And if one believes in their heart 
and confesses the power of this Jesus with their tongue, then one can transcend the carnal human nature of sin, death, and suffering. And through Jesus, they can believe, they, and they can, they, with their belief, they can change the law of the flesh and make all things subject to the law of the spirit. And so the atoning work of Jesus brokers a new lease on life defined by good health and financial wealth. This is why it's also known as health and wealth theology. So Jesus, in this conception, not only holds the keys to life and death, Jesus also holds the keys to an abundant life that, yes, can include keys to a new home and a new car. Because, as it is written in 1 John, according to their theology, as they interpret it, I wish in all things that you will prosper, even as your soul prospers. Yet the more I lectured and talked about the prosperity gospel in front of formerly educated audiences in academic spaces like this one, the longer I was teaching at Harvard University, the more I tended to leave the auditoriums like this one with people shaking their heads. Like my interlocutor at Princeton, there's this sense of how anyone could be so gullible as to fall for such Elmer Gantry-like snake oil salesmen peddling this form of theological powerball. And it's actually this moment with my reflective respo reflexive response to the question. It's the moment that my research and reflections about the prosperity and the gospel in America took a decided turn. Because up to this point, my writings were more aligned and had contributed to prevailing accounts like the academic consensus. I traced the prosperity gospel through Pentecostalism in general and post-war healing revivals in particular. The prosperity gospel then became largely the do domain of working class whites and more charismatically inclined communities of color. The Pentecostals, Southern folk, Midwestern folk, the Okies. Health and wealth theologies developed on the margins rather than within the mainstream of what we typically define as American religion. Or even Protestantism in America. So why does this matter? Why did I want to bring this to your attention today? Why did I say, go to BC and talk about this? For one, it underscores for me Jesus's words in the Gospel of Matthew. We can often see the speck in another's eye without considering the plank in our own eye. Better stated, we can frown on the glitz and glare of another without considering the golden calves that constitute the objects of our own worship. My friend's question, a relatively healthy, wealthy male New Englander reveals how many of us who find the materialistic features of the prosperity gospel problematic are unable to see how all communities of faith distinguish themselves by aesthetic accoutrements. All communities of faith distinguish themselves by cultural preferences that will bring them honor. Does anybody need evidence? Let's take a walk around this campus. <laughs> Communities gather and employ material resources as markers and values of symbols and of your worth. Churches are not immune. For some congregants, it includes wearing designer clothes, seeing their congregation on television, and knowledge that their pastor drives a car worthy of celebrities and corporate executives. 
other congregations might spend millions more than necessary in renovations to meet safety and accessibility regulations in order to maintain a traditional outward appearance of a previous century. <laughs> Did y'all get that? Yeah. <laughs> I would make sure that one congregation self indulgent pastoral private jet is another church's Tiffany windows. One pastor's custom made three piece suit and Rolex watch is another minister's hand stitched environmentally friendly vestments. Whether it's an award winning choir, a worship orchestra, state of the art sound system, or historical architecture, churches, communities of faith advertise what makes them unique. Some might say that these previous examples I just provided actually constitute a primary function of what we call religion. That which organizes us, that which distinguishes us. Such marks of distinction are heightened when religion and consumption collide. My dear sister at Yale, Catherine, Katie Lofton, Catherine Lofton, she argues that religion organizes insofar as passionate commitments take the form of our regulating structures. Of course, shared values and religious rituals, they govern our regulating structures. Yes, the songs we sing, the prayers we pray, absolutely. But Katie Lofton notes that we should not discount the power of aesthetic markers established by consumptive patterns in our communities of faith. Like that pipe organ that came to my mind. That which we consume reflects who we seek to become, and it marshals us into communities of common identity. So like religion, consumer activity aligns our pensions, our preferences, our predilections into what we might readily identify or might be called our tastes. If we are what we are, worship, if we are what we worship, if we become what we worship. Would this not also be true of what we purchase? Of how we consume? Raise your hand if you're a student here. Get ready for this, what I'm going to talk about. I want you to think about how credit card companies and online retailers employ predictive algorithms to recommend specific consumer products to you. What do they do? They analyze your past shopping behaviors. They analyze what you click on. They analyze your Instagram, your social media feeds. as well as those who you are connected with and the tastes and preferences of those people. And in the process, they actually are able to create and establish an eerily accurate portrait of you. Do you know what I'm talking about? Right? They are able without knowing you having never ever met you, are able, based upon your tastes, your preferences, those you hang out with, the things that you've purchased, know so much about you. Hey, if you regularly purchase premium gasoline on your credit card, Predictive algorithms are going to start saying, Professor Owens, you drive a high-end luxury automobile. <laughs> yeah. 
Professor Willard, do you spend much time on real estate websites searching home values? Don't be surprised when you start noticing advertisements for furniture and home repair showing up in your browser. Just as our shared creedal commitments organize us into communities of faith, consumptive patterns align us into specific networks of common appetites. The late French theorist Pierre Bordeaux offers me helpful insight here as I'm thinking about this. In his classic social critique, this book, incredible book, Distinction, he argues that everyone in a modern democratic capitalist society, that we're always competing for status. We are always competing for status. And status is not just about income or wealth, though, of course, both do matter. But Bordeaux pays particular attention to cultural capital which reveals the appropriate behaviors, knowledge, base styles, and tastes according to social hierarchy. Cultural capital may be embodied, say for example, knowledge. That's cultural capital. It may be objectified. The tweed jacket one has on. Style of pumps one is wearing. Or it might be institutionalized. I am a graduate of. I'm, I attend church. But what's evident for Badu are these are all the ways that cultural cap capital, capital is cultivated and maintained by the presumed elites of a given society. So Bordeaux suggests that cultural capital shapes every sphere of our society, politics, religion, art, education. Those who have accrued the most cultural capital over time, who become social elites, have the power to establish preferred tastes. Think Broadway musicals a magazine subscription to the New Yorker and Harper's or a degree from an Ivy League institution. Think about those three things. Mark that in your mind if you're taking notes, right? Broadway musicals, Harper's, New Yorker, a degree from a top tier institution. Think about those over against a Tyler Perry stage play. Anybody here familiar with Tyler Perry? Yeah. People Magazine or TMZ or season tickets to the University of Alabama football. Juxtapose those against each other. What's true? Each is financially lucrative. Economic capital. Has anybody here ever tried to buy tickets to an Alabama football game? Right? Probably harder to get the tickets to Hamilton. Right? Each financially lucrative. Each holds mass appeal. Right? So they hold economic capital. They hold social capital. But the former examples signify an undeniable hierarchy of tastes in American culture. We just have to be honest and say that. There is a difference between Broadway and Tyler Perry. There is a difference between whether Harper's and New Yorker and People magazine, right, or The Inquirer, right? When I have company at my house, Eric Owens, he comes to visit me. I'm making sure Harper's is up on the table, right? Hide the Inquirer. Right? Because, and how has that been established and by whom? So such hierarchies actually tell us more about what social elites privilege as it does about the quality of expression or the value of said form. As P. 
Pierre Bourdieu puts it, taste, our tastes classify us. And it classifies the classifier. It classifies us and it classifies the classifier. So that's the first thing. And the second thing, and I'm trying, I'm going somewhere with this slowly, but I'm going. <laughs> the second thing is that it's also, there's something about the epistemological and cultural biases in the academic study of religion. Y'all understand, I'm having an argument with my friend who asked a question at the beginning, right? Everybody's with me on that? I'm having an argument with him. Says something about the biases in the academic study of religion. Biases that readily mount on the mutual reinforcing hinges of gender, race, and class. What we like to consider critical scholarship in the study of religion too often devolves into polemical commentary masquerading as objective analysis when engaging minoritized communities. My dear brother Bob Orsi, he says that the academic study of religion has been organized around a distinct and identifiable set of moral judgments and values that are more often explicit and commonly evident more in convention than in precept. In other words, as scholars, we already work from default categories of good and bad. What's good religion and what's bad religion? And these categories of good religion and bad religion are informed by our what? By the tastes that classify us and that distinguish us. And so therefore, if we are going to add and expand forms of knowledge, ways of knowing, knowledge about particular communities, then behind our scholarly, quote unquote, objective analysis is a kind of performance of cultural taste that we are seeking to produce and project in our scholarship. And so we end up calling what we think is bad or good or real or true. And we think about forms of religious violence. We think about forms of apparent greed. We think about overt exclusion. We think about particular conceptions of religious, ethnic, or sexual identity. And more often than not, particularly when we are talking about people who fall outside of a cultural frame, that ends up becoming bad religion. While we have all kind of epistemic blind spots to those faith traditions and communities and people that adhere to certain other cultural tastes. And so these examples of bad religion construct a big tent around the so-called folk sensibilities. And more often than not, it's people of color, it's working class white brothers and sisters, and it's often highly gendered when bad religion is often seen as overly effeminized or overly emotional. And deprivation theories ensconce the poor and working classes into puerile false consciousness. Both religious ecstasy, religious violence, their desperate pleas for the emotionally unstable and culturally alienated. And health and wealth theologies are just simply the spiritual aspirations of lazy folk. And in the process, a process that yours truly has contributed to in his own work, minoritized communities of color become the gutter in which all bad religion seemingly collects. But now I am here to say 
without feelings of regret. If you want to know what God has to do with luxury items, cars, planes, fancy clothes, new buildings for those folk down there, it's the same thing that it has to do with those of you who are in your Brooks Brothers and J Press and the Andover shop singing a mighty fortress is our God before a $6 million organ. Same thing. Why? Because that God desires for people to be wealthy and prosper is not just a theological conception of those folk down there, but it has deep roots in the American spiritual imagination and it is a staple of American Protestantism. I'm talking about American Protestantism because that's what I know about the best. We can trace the theological architecture of this all the way back to the Puritans and in many other settings from the so-called mainline Protestants in the late 19th century to charismatic Pentecostals all across the board. My point is simply that the interpreters of American religion have found it easier to identify what's often pejoratively referred to as prosperity gospel on social margins than within the Protestant mainline. And it's possible that this has to do with just the naturalization of white Anglo-Saxon Protestantism as a normative ideal and co of cultural status and prestige in American society. For example, let's talk about the American dream. Anybody ever heard that term before? The very concept of the American dream is actually much older than the appellation or the title. It's funny because the origin of the phrase, the American dream, drips with historical irony in the 20th century. Because it's a 20th century construction born of the Great Depression. James Truslow Adams a Wall Street investment banker who became a Pulitzer Prize winning popularizer of New England history. In the 1930s sought to draft a narrative that captured and conveyed the spiritual values of what he said made America unique. Adams was deeply troubled by Franklin Roosevelt's response to the depression and New Deal politics. Widespread government interventions, Adams believed, threatened the features of the United States that spurred her greatness, freedom, individuality, ingenuity. And so Adams felt that New Deal's policies were just another side of the materialistic coin that gave way to the roaring 20s. So just as money, mansions, and motor cars had to become ultimate goods in themselves in the run up to the economic crash, Adams felt like felt like programs like the Federal Emergency Relief Administration and the Works Progress Administration that gave money to states for accessible jobs for the unemployed. He felt that this is just another symptom of crass materialism of American society. And these challenges are going to threaten the spirit of America. And so the only way to combat what James Truslow Adams considered a hedonistic culture was to resuscitate the spiritual values. I'm using his language, not mine. The spiritual values of American society and America's purpose. And these spiritual values created the condition where every individual had an opportunity to search and strive for their divine purpose that God gave them to be prosperous. And it's this divine purpose that, I quote, that will allow people to attain the fullest stature which they are innately capable and recognized by others what they are, regardless of the fortuitous circumstances of birth position. And this is what he, 
referred to in his 1931 book, The Epic of America, as the American dream. Interestingly enough, publishers actually didn't want to name the book The American Dream. That's what he tried to name it, which tells us that they thought it was actually weird. And, and uh, we know they thought it was weird. And, and so the term American Dream in the 1930s was not a, in common use. 1930s. Right. But he clearly struck a resonant chord. Because he tapped into something this tradition of American ambition that indeed had roots in the early republics. Because we know that in the 1830s, Alexis de Tocqueville, he called it the charm of anticipated success of America. Americans have this charm of anticipated success. They all just assume that they're going to be successful and prosperous. Right. And so... Adams, he says, hey, if we're going to unleash this, this divine call that God put on our lives, then we have to have this freedom so that we all can then live into this prosperity. It's called the American dream. Adams wasn't alone. At the same time, there was a brother named Alfred Whitney Griswold wrote a dissertation at Yale called The American Gospel of Success. And like Adams, Griswold was born of and remained among the American gentry. His mother, Alfred Whitney Griswold's mother, she was a descendant of Eli Whitney. Eli Whitney of the cotton gin wealth. And his paternal lineage included six governors of the colony that would eventually become the state of Connecticut. And Griswold attended the Hotchkiss School prior to earning his A.B. and his Ph.D. from Yale University. He met his wife, Mary Brooks, daughter of a multimillionaire Pennsylvania stock investor, John Brooks, while summering on Martha's Vineyard. And apart from one year serving as an investment house in New York City, following undergrad, Griswold spent his entire professional career in New Haven on the campus of Yale University. I'm talking about somebody who wrote about the American gospel of <laughs> success. Right. And though he actually countered Adams as it relates to New Deal politics, he actually was somewhat of a progressive, but he was actually a social cultural conservative. As president of Yale, he supported the coat and tie policy in the dining hall to combat what many considered the erosion of standards of resultant of Yale admitting non-traditional students. Do you know what non-traditional students meant? Jews and public school kids. Griswold believed that by admitting public school kids to Yale, the college was lowering its standards and threatening Yale's image. Admitting students for their extracurricular and artistic excellence, including spark, sports, that was another way of diluting intellectual, inst in intellectual credibility at institutions like Yale. And it's this kind of conception where he spent his career writing books and that followed on his dissertation entitled The American Gospel of Success, where he heralded this ideal of mobil mobility, not merely for its impact on the individual, but for its importance to society. It was not about mobility of the disenfranchised. The moral ideal of the American dream for both Adams and Griswold, placed a greater emphasis on the social stability that it engendered. 
Like the prevailing sociological views of the day, theorists maintain that the best way to ensure social cohesiveness and continuity was to affirm aristocratic values of the American upper class. Social elites constitute a governing establishment that represent the aspirations of the larger society. I'm pulling from both of their writings here. And among the leading proponents of this, for example, was socio sociologist Edward Digby Baltzo, who was at the University of Pennsylvania at the time, who believed that a true establishment ruled by tradition and authority without being co coercive or authoritarian. What does this mean? It means that an establishment carries traditional values which are believed to inspire the masses. If we can keep the masses inspired, for instance, through wealth accumulation and public service, then the establishment then will justify the authority by continuing to assimilate new families into the elite ranks with each generation. This is the American dream. The ideal of the American dream guarantees that all individuals have access to this elite class according to their natural endowments. Opportunity is afforded. The gifted shall rise. Access to the establishment is possible for all. Every child, regardless of race, ethnicity, or station birth, can penetrate the ranks of the elite if they are intelligent and industrious enough. And following among on 19th and early 20th century developmental conceptions of humanity, if you are intelligent and industrious enough, then you would have been at the right place. Like a private prep school. This conception of the American dream then was never about social equality. It is about equal opportunity to enter the aristocratic ranks. A child of humble origins can look in the door of social privilege and cultural power and declare to the aristocratic establishment the words of the Hebrew matriarch Ruth. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people. Your people, your God shall be my God. And in the process, we all embrace, consume, digest a particular conception of society that concretizes and reinforces hierarchies and structures of dominance. So why is this important to me? Because now that I think and I go back to the prosperity gospel, it underscores the importance of seeing something like the prosperity gospel as an essential feature rather than a deviation from the Protestant establishment. And it also allows me and us to have a both a more critical and compassionate interpretation of this quintessentially American religious phenomenon. Our interpretation is more critical insofar as one recognizes the taken for granted aspects of the American dream, meritocracy, individual acquisition, and divinely ordered hierarchies. And these attributes and characteristics of the American dream prove to be mutually reinforcing myths that too often obscure the widespread misery and gross economic and social inequity and inequality of our society. The American dream, the American gospel of success gilds our unfulfilled promise. 
but our lenses should also be more compassionate to the people who we actually look at through supercilious lenses quite often. When we see that the historically disenfranchised, when we see that in their hopes and in their dreams, that they have the same hopes, dreams, spiritual aspirations as all of us, particularly those of us sitting in this room. We all want to belong. We all want our dignity affirmed. We all want to drink from the wells of freedom, justice, and opportunity. And quite often the people who we mock and who we laugh at and we say, what in the world does this have to do with God? More often than not, they are just trying to declare with any accoutrement that they can that their life matters. And in a society that has taught them that our citizenship is tied with our consumerism, it makes sense. One doesn't have to agree with it. Of course, I don't to understand it. And therefore, we can then look at all ourselves. We can look at them. We can look at ourselves through critical eyes and in compassionate eyes, saying that their spiritual ambitions are as American as hope and American as inequality. I'll take whatever questions you may have. I want for you to, to address for a minute whether what you're talking about, the American gospel, says um, incarnates differently in Catholicism and Judaism than in Protestantism. So we were walking across campus today. BC is a very affluent campus. It's considered one of the four elite Catholic institutions in the United States. Um, we're, we're building a new engineering building that looks like it was built in the 13th century. Because you know, it's Gothic and it's supposed to look Gothic and they're more expensive and all these sorts of things. Mm -hmm. no, I, I, I've never heard of any, any Jesuit or any professor on this campus talk about sort of an explicit gospel experience. But it's just more subtle. I was wondering if, if, if your sense of studying this tradition, uh, which is essentially in a Protestant tradition, tradition or coming out of the Puritan tradition in New England, it, does it incarnate differently in Catholicism and Judaism? And I don't know, maybe Susanna wants to. Uh, I would say absolutely. I would say yes, because I'm working from the assumption that it incarnates differently in all communities. And that's why I think that if we're going to pay attention to it, Right. And offer a critical lens. View it through a critical lens and offer a moral, social, political critique of it, then we have to be specific in our doing. Right. Um, because to just lump it broadly. Right. Is to do violence to communities that ha are always animated by different aspirations. Does it incarnate itself within Catholic and Jewish communities? Oh, absolutely. For example, I mean, I talked about, I mean, I talked about the sociolo sociologist Baltzell and, and often a lot of his writings are just simply about the integration and assimilations of country clubs in America, right? And how that, became, and how that was such contested spaces for both Jews and Catholics alike, right? Um, and and so this larger notion of the American gospel that I'm talking about, right, that has largely been secularized through the American dream, but has these, these largely Protestant and even Puritan roots, right, become, kind of comes a ruling ideal and frames the cultural habitus of American society where it's shaping all of us, right? And so whether we're talking about African-Americans migrating from the South, whether we're talking about uh, Jewish immigrants or, or whether we're talking about large Catholic communities, we're all shaped by this in a particular sort of way. Right? 
But to just simply say, to look at it all, or look at any particular community, we have to be, what I'm trying to say is we have to be careful of who we say, oh, this is just crass materialism and conspicuous consumption run amok. Because my point is, we're much quicker to say that about some communities than we are other communities. And the communities that we are most quick to say that about, which I would include Catholic and Jewish communities in that, are communities that have actually been scratching and clawing for access. Oh yeah, that's a good question. Uh, big question too. Well, it's, it's what I don't agree with it, particularly in American society is probably where I left off the way that citizenship and consumerism are so closely tied together, right? To be a, to be a citizen right, is based upon one's actual consumption power, right? And uh, I mean, think about the work of William Leach or others, where it's this, um, when we think about the protest movements in American society, they're so often tied to one being a, one's capacity to show and demonstrate purchasing power. And that, I think, in itself dehumanizes. An example would be sit-ins, 1960 sit-ins, Greensboro, North Carolina, right? Students, North Carolina A&T. One of the things that historians know, but we often don't like to discuss, is the ways that the lunch counters were targeted because they were denying purchasing power of other otherwise bourgeois African-Americans. And so these were seen as viable places of target for us to give us access, not to give everyone access, but these college students to give us access because what you're actually denying us is our ability to perform our middle classness. You're denying us the American dream. And if that is the place where one begin one's moral posture to make a claim on inclusion, right? That's a highly problematic place to start. But that is so often the case because of these kind of default assumptions concerning the recognition of our humanity in American society. And so it's this kind of coupling purchasing power with humanity. That's just one of the reasons. I mean, theologically, we could, you know, I mean, we could, we could pull on that thread for a long time, but that's just one of the reasons that. Hmm. Yes, and then I'll go. There were a couple there were a couple of things. Thank you for that question. That's actually a wonderful question. It gives me a chance to share. There were a couple of things. 
One is, um, one was when I got to, when I arrived at Harvard University as a professor, assistant professor, I had already been writing about this phenomenon for some years. And the first thing that kind of pricked my conscience was when newspapers or reporters would contact me about, and this is before I took the job at the Memorial Church, when they would contact me about commenting about a prosperity gospel preacher or, or something along those lines, I found myself becoming increasingly hesitant to do so. Because I think I saw myself on TV one time and I saw myself talking about this preacher at a large congregation with a large following of folk. And I saw my name in Harvard University next to it and it made me feel some kind of way. Because it made me feel like I was taking pot shots at everyday people. And though I was critiquing the ministry and what was some highly problematic behavior going on, it became pitted and even in the framing of that television segment, it became pitted like this was this Harvard professor lecturing these folk about what's bad about their religion, kind of what I was touching on here. And so I was feeling that at a certain point. That was one moment. Another moment was just becoming a part and leading that precious community of the Memorial Church and just knowing the inordinate, incredible resources that were available to us. And how it was just so often taken for granted and no one would call into question so much about our existence and our community of faith, how it was just, it was normalized, it was natural. But I can tell you, if you had taken the Memorial Church, taken all of its resources, taken us and put and placed us in any community down south throughout the Southern Crest and filled it with white Pentecostals, filled it with Latino brothers and sisters, filled it with African Americans, then probably somebody would have been accusing us or mocking us for being parvenus, living above our station. And that leads to the third thing that happened. There was, a, uh, there was a preacher that I would write about, used to write about, and he was a protege of Oral Roberts. He was a prosperity gospel preacher. His name was uh, Carlton Pearson, right? And he, he made national news, actually Netflix made a movie about him because when he made a theological shift and theological conversion, the evangelical community tossed him, threw him out. He was a premier African-American televangelist out of the city of Tulsa, right? And his media library was about 40 years of American religious broadcasting all the major gospel artists, Oral Roberts, Billy Graham, you name it. He had it because he was a major producer. And we were able, during my time there, to get him to donate his archive to Harvard, to the Divinity School, because it's a treasure trove for historians of American religion in the 20th century. The more t I spent time with him in Tulsa, Oklahoma, right? And is anybody here familiar well, many of you now, are now because it's gotten so much attention, the, uh, what they call the quote unquote race riots, mm -hmm. right? Which was, you know, a euphemism if you ever call one, right? But that which happened, right? That which happened in 1921 in Tulsa, Oklahoma, that attack on Greenwood, Archer, and Pine, the intersection, that section known as Black Wall Street. Unapologetically, an attack on African-American intellectual financial aspirations. 
You know that. First time federal government ever, well, only time, dropped a bomb from an old World War I plane on the community. That's why, that's where the song, y'all, you familiar with the Gap Band? Young people, y'all don't know the Gap Band? Charlie Wilson, have anybody heard of Charlie Wilson? Charlie Wilson and the Gap Band? Okay, all right, good. Young people. Okay, young people, do me a favor. First thing you do when you leave this lecture, I don't care if you don't remember anything I said, you probably won't, but Jonathan Lee Walton taught you about the Gap Band. Gap Band is probably the best, coldest funk group of the 19. 80s song, uh, Outstanding, Burn Rub On Me, and You Drop the Bomb On Me. Okay. Trust me, all of you are going to be with your roommates tonight. And you can even hit me on social media if you want to <laughs> and just say, you write Professor Walton, they were cold. <laughs> Eric, am I lying? It's, it's <laughs> so, Gap Band, where did they get their name from? Greenwood, Archer, and Pine. The Wilson brothers, Greenwood, Archer, and Pine, they grew up in that neighborhood. And before the United States would acknowledge, because they didn't acknowledge it until the 1990s, before they acknowledged it, Gap Band recorded a song entitled You Drop the Bomb On Me. Okay? And it's one of the early music videos. They're wearing military fatigues and they're dancing and they're singing about a woman. Okay? And the lines are, you turn me out, you turn me on, and then you drop me to the ground. You drop the bomb on me. They weren't singing about a woman. They were singing about a nation. And that was their hometown shout out. That was their hometown shout out song. I'm answering your question. In the 90s, when Carlton Pearson was holding these prosperity gospel events for the African American, showing up dressed to the nines, dressed to the nines, Minks, furs, right? Oral Roberts said to him one time, I found this out in interviews, where are all these people coming from? I didn't know African Americans lived like this. It's this kind of display of dignity and pride. And you're talking about a community that 70 years later, that had lived under this awareness that Black Wall Street had been destroyed. Like most lynchings in American society, it didn't have anything to do with a woman. It didn't have anything to do with sex. It had to do with economic competition and economic vitality and economic vibrancy. And so you're talking about a community that literally had a drop, bomb dropped on them for being prosperous. Who am I? Now all of a sudden, you see what I said, thinking about these communities in particular ways. We're going to dismiss this as just greed. No, we have to be more careful than that. I have to be, as a scholar, more careful. So that was the third movement, learning more and connecting the history of Tulsa to this Pentecostal strand of prosperity gospel that came up among black people that saw themselves in the tradition of these people who said fleecy locks and dark complexion cannot forfeit nature's claim. Skin may differ, but affection dwells in black and white the same. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's all my brother. Uh, my question is, 
it has to do with the, the implications of this uh, this gospel, prosperity gospel, to the Catholic school system, especially the uh, public school, the uh, parochial schools, the primary and secondary schools. Uh, a lady from Gosstown, New Hampshire, her name was Mary Perkins Ryan. She wrote a book, Are Parochial Schools the Answer, with the subtitle, Catholic Education in the Light of the Council, referring to the Second Vatican Council. Her basic thesis was that these parochial schools, the uh, Catholic, uh, secondary, and primary, were getting so elite and uh, so expensive with the poor being left to the public school system that uh, from the Christian point of view, you could no longer justify it with, because of the elite nature of it. Do you think that this has any implication for uh, what you're saying? <clears throat> what I am comfortable saying is that if there's a model that's presumed to be normative, the dangerous implications, and this also speaks to the theological question of why I find this problematic. If there's a model that becomes normative, the dangerous implications of those of us who are seeking access to replicating it, particularly replicating it within our own communities, and so therefore contributing to the same sorts of, and reinforcing, as I ended the lecture, reinforcing and concretizing the same levels of hierarchies and social inequities that we often found ourselves fighting against. And so that is where I am comfortable, you know, saying that we have to be mindful of that. And our <coughs> cries and our pleas of access and belonging, that we just don't reconstitute structures that are just exclusionary and thus violent. Right? Because that has no theological claim or basis in the tradition that I profess to be a part of, in the tradition, what I'm hearing, the tradition that, that the critic of that, that person who wrote that text is lifting up. Eric and Ben, Susan. Yeah. Okay. Okay. You mentioned kind of hypocrisy in the uh, Christ's image of kind of the sty in your own eye or mm -hmm. the log in your own eye, specifically with regards to kind of affluent or uh, like more socially, <clears throat> socially elite communities of faith. Do you see that there are other problems that arise out of kind of the failure to recognize that? Um, I know, like you know, being a like a pastor at Harvard, um, like do you see there being other problems that like maybe wealthier or like more socially elite people of faith have with regards to the American gospel of success? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, wealthy people have the same problems that impoverished people have, and impoverished people have the same problems that wealthy people have, right? You know, it's, it's I think the, the, the critique that I was trying to offer was, to where you started, was the inability to be able to see those problems and or see possibilities based upon the blinders of our own social privilege and position. Right. Right. I love the way our dear brother Cornell puts it. Right. I love the way Cornell West puts it, right? It's drawing this dividing line between problem people versus people with problems. Right. And it's when you're, it's uh, when you have certain access and certain privileges then you're just a person with a problem. Okay. And people with problems we're able to empathize with. We're able to feel pity for. Mm -hmm. But yet when you're a problem people, that means that you are innately deviant, insufficient, and, you're, and you become a homogeneous block or a monolithic blob, as 
as he puts it, <laughs> right? One is indistinguishable from the other, right? And so therefore you're able to write off those folk, these people, so much easier. And so I think that is, you know, kind of problem that sits at its core that I'm trying to needle at here. Thanks so much for your thoughts. A lot of food for thought and I'd love to continue this conversation longer longer time. But one of the questions that comes to mind due to, to your historian's hat. Um, one of the themes in American history, in American Protestant religious history, has also been Swiss and a sort of concern for practicality and being close to the ground. I wonder if, if, if you see that as, as being rejected in the prosperity gospel of, of sort of displays, et cetera. I take your point mm-hmm. of course that, that wealthy, wasi, you know, environments are pretend to be thrifty but are invested in some of the same you know, epochal style. Um, but I wonder if the virtue of thrift is something that is in the conversation around the gospel, the prosperity gospel, as a human being lead to prosperity, or, or what, it, you know, historically or in the present? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I actually think that the, I think that the um, notion of thrift particularly when I think about Max Weber, for example, early 20th century and the Protestant ethic, I actually think that that was an ideological project on his part, right? Because America, in trying to reclaim thrift as this kind of value coming out of Puritanism, because America had already lost that battle coming out of the 19th century in the Industrial Revolution, right? I mean, coming, when we think about the kind of shift from small scale capitalism to consumer capitalism, right, and corporate capitalism in the late 19th century, when, we, when we're seeing this shift with the Industrial Revolution, right, and, and um, all of these virtues that were supposed to be the moral virtues to allow one to be successful, thrift, sobriety, right? Um, They were becoming increasingly out of sync with the realities on the ground. And so much less than a kind of Horatio Albert aspiration of one being able to work themselves up the more appropriate model was actually, uh, what's my man from a uh, 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 Charles Dickens Christmas tale? Scrooge? Not Ebenezer Scrooge, Cratchit. no, Cratchit. Cratchit was actually much more reflective of American kind of capitalism late 19th century, right? This kind of middle management, ceiling on his head, working oneself, but still finding oneself in poverty. And so therefore they were kind of there started, the culture started to shift. Right? I think Gail Benderman, she really writes about the gender dyna- dimensions of this, how these men who had the ceiling on their head with the, gross, with the growth of corporate capitalism and people making money off speculation, the people who were at thrift, sobriety and all that were increasingly becoming feminized. And so what ends up happening? Well, this kind of cult of the new starts to develop in the late 19th century. And we move from kind of this productive mo- these productive models of capitalism to consumer capitalism and kind of embrace of luxury and luxury goods. And to underscore the point, who is the most popular preacher in the 19th, late 19th century in American society? Protestant preacher, you, test for you, Eric most popular Protestant preacher in the late 19th century. Henry Ward Beecher. Henry Ward Beecher. And what's Henry Ward Beecher known for as much as anything else? He preached at uh, Franklin's piano. I'm sorry? He's the father of Harry Beecher Stowe. Brother. He's a brother. Brother, brother of Harry Beecher Stowe. Uncle Tom's captain, yeah, brother of Harry Beecher Stowe. No. Homes in New York and London. 
shopping accounts, velvet and silk, right? High, high, high class gardens that he was known for, right? As a matter of fact, he has a phrase and it's escaping me right now. I'm embarrassed that it's escaping me right now. But he was trying to speak to this notion of benevolence, uh, Eric, and kind of as a virtue and to justify his kind of embrace of conspicuous consumption and luxury goods. And he described it as a form that, that his sartorial splendor and his embrace of beauty was a form of charity for the poor. Because, and this is in one of his books, when they can look in through my gate and see the landscaping of my lawn, in that they find inspiration. <laughs> right? Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in Whoa, thank you, oh, Jonathan. Oh, one do we, can we, I have one more question. Okay. Sure. Do you want to ask it now or do you want to ask it at dinner? <laughs> Can I ask him that? This question. Yeah. It's a, it's a, I, I was just interested in asking you about prayer, prayer experience, and, and liturgy in particular. And I was struck with something you said toward the beginning about people getting dressed to go to church in beautiful clothes. And I'm thinking about people, like Jews, who get ready for high holidays by going to Saks Fifth Avenue and you know, getting dolled up, which option will I wear, which day, etc. Uh, uh, and in that connection, I also think about some of the beautiful churches in Europe, magnificent, gorgeous, talk about wealth and display and so forth. And obviously the people, the vast majority of people who went to worship in such a place were not wealthy and did not identify, but I understand what you said, the aspiration, mm -hmm. the projection, and so on. But then, then today we have, at least I can say in many synagogues, we do have Temple Emmanuel over here, people wearing the outfit that is suited to the magnificence of the place, which is different. And I'm wondering about the difference in the experience of prayer and also about the liturgy itself. I want to ask you about the synagogues, but in general, in some of these churches, are there certain hymns that are emphasized or passages from the Bible that are more, more are favored, let's say, mm -hmm. to create a different kind of prayer experience, which I am not sure it's quite different mm -hmm. what went on in the Middle Ages in, in European churches it, that's a really great question I, let, me, let me you know uh, I'll answer from say for example African American prosperity gospel churches right those who are unapologetic like word of faith with Creflo Dollar it a absolutely impacts the, the liturgy for instance in, in Creflo Dollar's church and other Fred Price, he was another prominent uh, word of faith pastor in Los Angeles. Songs known as the quote unquote Negro spirituals, they will not sing, right? They will not sing, actually they preach against, right? Why? Because it is part of in their language, the negative self-conception that God is tied to slavery, right? Because these songs, that it originated from the soul of a lamenting people longing for freedom, right? Now, there's all kinds of ways that we can unpack the spirituals like the blues, right? That there's double entendre going on, that these were songs, that they were, that they were coded veiled messages within the songs, that, and that they were ways actually to throw off the scent of those who actually uh, uh, would want to squelch there any sort of affirmation of dignity whatsoever, right? Or like the blues, it's just actually in the lament and in the wail, one actually sings oneself happy to a place of joy by being willing, willing to embrace and tackle and confront head on the grief and suffering of life. That cuts against the kind of 19th century New England positive thinking that informs the word of faith movement. Because what you're actually doing to them is putting negativity into the air, right? right? And so for example, if something is going wrong when you pray, you don't pray about 
your travails and traumas. You don't use the language travail. You don't use the language of challenge. No, even you, you say, if you're going through something, you'll say, I'm between blessings. And so something like Mahalia Jackson, I'm coming up the rough side of the mountain and I'm doing the best that I can. No, that song is expelled from the liturgy. Yeah. Great question, great question. Please join me in thanking Jonathan. Thank you.